カセットいろいろカセットビジョンモンスターマンションパクパクモンスターギャラクシアまだまだあるよ君はいくつ持ってるエポック社のカセットビジョンこんにちは。As you can imagine, the machine was one of the many Pong systems that flooded the 70s, though it did have some interesting industry firsts. The machine was completely wireless, and I do mean 100% wireless. Not only did it use batteries, as was relatively common at the time, but it actually contained its own RF transmitter, so you didn't even need to physically connect it to your TV, instead, just tuning it in like you would any broadcast TV channel. Just as it had in the West, this new craze swept Japan, leading to a booming video game market. Then in 1981, Epoch stepped up their game by producing Japan's first homegrown cartridge based console with the launch of the Cassette Vision, which was also the cheapest machine available at the time. But then in 1983, the name that be- would become synonymous with video games for the next 35 years. Blew Epoch out of the water as Nintendo launched the industry defining Famicom. Following closely on their heels came Sega with their SG1000 console, and together these two companies would set the standard for the 8 bit generation, quickly surpassing the cassette vision in every way. Epoch weren't about to take this line down though, and quickly reacted in 1984 with the Super Cassette Vision, using the Super prefix a whole six years before Nintendo would make it their entire marketing plan in 1990. The new system featured a 4 MHz NEC processor, loosely based around the popular Xilog Z80 CPU, but not entirely compatible due to some unique instructions and slight tweaks found only in this version. It also featured 128 bytes of RAM and another 4 kilobytes of video RAM. It could display 16 colors at once from a total palette of 512, with up to 128 sprites on screen at any time. Along with two channel selectable RF output, the system also included built in RGB out via SCART, making it the first home console to offer such optimized picture quality, a feature that didn't become an industry standard for some time. Retailing at less than 15,000 yen, it was very competitive on price with its rivals. However, it was also more complicated to manufacture, and so the margins were much tighter for Epoch than for Nintendo or Sega. Determined to stay in the fight, though, Epoch turned to outside companies for help with international distribution, enlisting Yeno for the European launch later in the year, where the system would stay the same with the exception of logos, language, and power supplies. No region lockout was included, making cartridge production more cost effective and allowing today's collectors to import games more easily. But before we see how the system performed, let's take a look at the hardware itself and a few of the games. So, the first thing you'll notice here is, of course, that this machine is branded Yeno on the console and, of course, on the box. And that's because this is the Yeno branded version. This is the version that was released in Europe. Obviously, much more easy for me to get hold of than the Japanese version. But they are essentially the same machine. They take the same cartridges, different power supply, and there is some other possible differences. But we'll go through those as we look through it. The box design, very much similar to the Japanese box design. Uh, except it does have Japanese text, obviously.、Uh, although it is kind of odd, actually, I suppose, that the console's name is written in English when on the Japanese box it is written in Japanese, and this is a French box, so you would assume maybe it would be translated to French. I don't know.、Uh, but yeah, it's the Super Cassette Vision. Yay! Looking at the system, you can see it is really nice and compact. It is, I'd say it's a better looking system, to be honest, than,、uh, than the Famicom, at least. Maybe not the SG1000, but maybe the Famicom and probably the, the Master System, the original Master System, at least. It's just a little bit more compact and nice. It's not going to take up your room very much. Looking at the top of it, guess what that is? That's the on off switch. You have a little keypad here. 
for various game related settings just like a lot of consoles over the years have had keypads built into the controllers you can see the two little tab ports there which are so that overlays can be put onto this so it can be uh, specifically showing you what the controls are for the various games that you're playing you've got RAS there which I think is reset RAS reset yeah probably pause which uh, translates to pause in English Cartouche, I'm going to stop taking the mickey out of the fact that bits of it are in French, that's just silly. Obviously that's the cartridge port which has a good solid dust cover on it there, stopping any dust getting into the system and minimising the uh, risk of harm to the port, apparently, although it never really seems to work on many systems. Going around the back, you'll notice the AC adapter port, which obviously is how electricity gets into the machine, and the video uh, RVB, although obviously for us it's RGB, out. That's where the SCART lead goes. Now you will notice this one, unlike what I said earlier, does not have the uh, RF port with the RF channel switch. I'm unsure if all of the Yeno version ones had the RF uh, not installed, or if this is just a later revision. I haven't managed to find anything online that would uh, support either theory. Uh, I do find it quite odd that they would do away with RF completely. Um, Europe did adopt RGB very, very quickly, but at this point in time, in 1984, there will have still been an enormous number of TVs that didn't have a SCART socket on them. Um, I'm just trying to think. I think in our house we maybe had one TV uh, in the early 90s that had a SCART lead, uh, SCART socket. So yeah, this wouldn't have been compatible. It does seem really odd and short-sighted for them to not put it there. Um, but as I say, this could be a later revision, I'm not entirely sure. Obviously, if this was the Japanese version, uh, you would have an RF socket here and a little switch, which I'll probably be showing you somewhere on screen right now. Looking underneath, everything you would expect, really, a little label telling you bits and pieces. So you've got a serial number, voltage indication, all that kind of stuff, a vent and some feet for it to stand on. Around the side, not a lot going on. Around the other side, even less going on. Well, the same going on. And around the front, again, nothing going on. But it's when you open it up, there we go, that you find the two controllers, which are in here. Nice that they do tuck away into this little compartment here. Slightly less nice, however, that they're hardwired. Not a big fan of hardwired controllers, because if they do break, that's your lot. Um, whereas, obviously, if you can remove them, you can replace them. But, you know... We can forgive it. It's in it's an early days console. Really nice controller, really. Fits in your hand nicely there. Uh, and you can see your fingers automatically go to where those buttons are. So it's not a problem at all. And obviously, your other hand uses this joystick. It's quite an odd feeling joystick. Part of me wants to say it's quite a clicky feeling joystick, but I don't want you thinking it's anything like the Neo Geo Pocket joystick. It's It's not. But it is quite a nice responsive controller and as I say it sits really nicely in the hand. I think even with its sharp corners um, you wouldn't have any problem using this for an extended period of time if you chose to do so. And obviously the other controller is there too. With a little bit of cajoling and fiddling about with wires they do eventually fit back under the cover port. Although chances are I'm not going to be able to do that on camera am I because it would be too easy so let's just ignore it. The games come in these rather nice little boxes. I quite like how neat they are, quite compact, as is the case with most of the system. You can tell this is a Japanese game, obviously, with Japanese text. But as I've said, they're completely cross-compatible. There are no issues as far as I'm aware. Flip open the nice little flap at the front there, and you find your instruction manual. And obviously, if the game does have a overlay for the keypad, you would also find that in there. Pop out the cartridge. And you can see it's nicely tailored little bit of space there for the cartridge to pop in and out of. Quite nice storage. Uh, as a result, these boxes do seem to have survived a lot better than the likes of NES and SNES boxes. And I think it is probably because they're so much smaller, so you don't, you know, you're not going to get rid of them. But also they are actually genuinely good boxes, you know. What's the point in letting them get harmed? So, yeah. You can see on top there, this game is Punch Boy. You get a little overview of the controls there on the front, which I quite like. Obviously, on this it's in Japanese, so I have no idea what the controls are saying. But we could assume, for example, it could be punch, jump, and move around. Fairly straightforward, but I just think it's a really cool idea for if you've lost the instruction book, at least you still know the controls. 
the the basic understanding of how to work the game is there i do like that and of course as you would expect that cartridge just pops into the top there press it down and you're ready to play punch boy So here is Punch Boy. Um, I'm sorry that we are having to film off the TV here, but my capture card was having none of it with this game. It was just refusing to uh, to pay any attention to it. It could get the sound, but not video. And eventually I lost the will to live. As I'm sure you will listening to this music. Uh, this is Punch Boy. So let's have a look. Yes, we'll do one player amateur. Press the start button. Yes. Now I have not been able to figure this game out for the life of me. I've watched videos of people playing it, no idea. I'm this little guy here, I can punch these eggs, I thought they were balls, they're eggs, because as you can see this yellow one here is about to turn into a dragon. These thingies up here, you can hit each of them once and it will fire a punchy thing, but you can't hit it again. Obviously you could use the punchy thing to kill the dragons, I get that. But there doesn't seem to be a way to bait the dragons in, and there's no other way to kill them. And yes, that music does go on constantly, and yes, it is tedious. They can burn you to death, they can hit you with an egg like that. They don't care about their baby's eggs, they'll throw them at you, they don't care. Uh, but your only way to kill them is with these punch things in the corners, but you can only use them once. So I really don't get it. See, look, hit him with the eggs, nothing. If I do get close enough to punch him, that won't hurt him either. Look, I don't... Why can't I go left? They can also put their flames through the walls, so it's not a good idea to be anywhere near them. Oh, oh, I can kill one, I can kill one! No! Ah, smush him! And he's dead. That is actually the first time I've managed to kill one of the dinosaur creatures in this game. That's probably the proudest moment of my adult life. And then I got hit by an egg that I punched myself. So, you know, not so proud anymore, really. Next up then, we have Wheelie Racer. Wasn't this music in Punch Boy? Or am I losing it? Anywho, Wheelie Racer will be a traditional racing game, so obviously it should make more sense than Punch Boy did. It can't really make any less. So again, amateur class. Press start, let's go. I'm assuming I have accelerator brake and yes. Challenge America! That is that that's more than America. Oh, I see that's the whole map and America has got the flag on it. I see I am the red car Everyone does the joystick wiggle to figure out who they are. You know you do All right away we go. Well, this makes sense. This is better Once again, the sound is not the super cassette visions strong point um, It's quite tedious really is its sound but graphically I've always thought the super ah, nards wow I'm very dead um, yeah graphically I've always thought the super cassette vision is very crisp it may not be coming along very well uh, to you guys because of filming on a cam on the camera rather than the capture card but it really is really sharp and really crisp way more than you ever see from the likes of the NES or the Master System. Look at the skills there. Yeah, don't act like you're not impressed. Um, yeah, it's... From a graphics point of view, I genuinely think the Super Cassette Vision is a fantastic machine. Uh, it's, but the sound, oh, it bores through your skull. It really, like, the, the sound really does hurt. And unfortunately for you guys, filming on a camera, you won't be losing any of that. It's only really the graphics that you'll be losing. There is just something about these graphics on the... Aha, more fuel, look at that. 
there is something about the graphics on the Super Cassette Vision that just feels a bit more special than most of the other 8-bit <laughs> systems. I am really a big fan of its graphics capability. How long is this race if we're in 59th at this point? sounded like that, you'd find it really tedious. Yeah, I think... I think you're getting the gist of Wheelie Racer there. Last up then, we'll take a look at Super Golf, although as it says on the screen, just golf, but the cartridge says Super Golf. Um, we'll have one player, because that's just me. Yeah, let's have the wind on. I have no idea what that means, so let's go with three, out and in, because why not? Press start button. Oh, have we gone back to the title screen? Oh, do we have to wait for her to take her shot? Maybe? If it doesn't go in, do we not get to play the game? Ah, here we go. Okay, so you can see we have wind direction. You see, once again, graphically, there's a lot going on here, and it's really sharp. I can't argue with it. And at least there's no annoying background music um, shared amongst games. That's positive. Okay, so I can change my club by pressing up and down. And left and right obviously changes my direction there in the bottom corner. Confer ah, right, and then she swings. It looks like a girl anyway, and that's how we judge our power. Let's go full pelt. Should have probably used a, a wood. A wood! I know I'm a child. Crack it! I'm not very good at any golf games, I feel I should point that out. However, that was a lucky ricochet. It ricocheted off the tree! How, like, that's quite advanced, surely, for this game to be doing that. Let's knock it a little bit over to the right because the wind is going to carry it left. Look at me pretending I know what I'm doing. Smack it! Ah, the wind did not curl it as much as I expected it to. Ooh. Oh, that might... Oh, oh! Ah, oh, at least we're on the green. Oh, and the graphics change to show you when you're on the green. Why would I want to be aiming miles away from there? Do we have a putter? PT's got to be the putter. Ah, bums. Ah, double bums. Yay! What was the par? Oh, par four and we got seven. That's not bad. Come on. All right, that's pretty bad, but I'm terrible at golf because it's a boring game. Um, but yeah, that's not a bad game. Again, we have the annoying, although admittedly very crystal clear music. Does it, when does it move on to the next hole? Do I have to press? No, I'm pressing no. Why, when do I get to move on to the next hole? Seriously. I have... what? Do I never get to play the next hole? Was I not good enough? Oh! Oh, so if I press play a... But I thought I picked one player. Oh, what? This is the second hole. Well, that's enough of that, I think. Screaming at me. Unfortunately for Epoch, their international launch was a failure, with Yeno only distributing to France and no other parties coming forward to bring the Super Cassette Vision to other countries. 
1985, the Japanese market received the pink-coloured ladies set, targeted at the female audience, which came with a matching pink travel case for games and accessories, along with a copy of the game Milky Princess. While the system only had a small library of around 30 games, it did feature a few mainstream titles, such as arcade racer Pole Position 2 and the popular Miner 2049er. Its game catalogue also contains another industry first, with carts like Pop and Chips being the first to include battery backed up saved games, another feature which would go on to become an industry standard in future. These games continued to be slowly released until 1986, when the last few were cancelled, leaving the Super Cassette Vision with less than 400,000 units sold compared to Nintendo's 61 million. Epoch would go on to try their hand in the portable gaming space with the Epoch Pocket, but sadly that too failed to make any impact on the industry, and they left the console market altogether in 1987, despite having contributed so much to it in such a short time. Epoch still exists today as a toy manufacturer, with their most well-known product being the Sylvanian Families line of toys. They also worked with Tomy to produce the interesting Barcode Battler electronic game and its Super Nintendo interface games. They frequently dabbled in the software side of the video game industry, so who really knows what the future holds for this sleeping giant and their big ideas? That's all we've got time for on this episode, but I hope you'll join us again in a few weeks' time as we delve back into video game history. Until then, you can follow the show on Twitter or Facebook, and of course, thanks for watching. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the show. I just want to let you know that as of the launch of Season 5, I've also relaunched the show's Patreon page, which you can get to by going to this link here, or of course the link in the description if you just want to click it and go straight through. If you do join that group, you'll have an opportunity to shape future shows by taking part in votes to decide what episodes I make next. So if there's a particular system that you really want to see me review, that's definitely your best way to do it. Um, it's as simple as, really. Uh, you don't have to do that, of course. Uh, I'll still make the episodes. I've got no intention of putting up a paywall. Don't worry about stuff like that. Uh, if you want to support the Patreon, click the link. You know, follow this link. Uh, if you don't want to support the Patreon, go click another video and watch something else. Cheers, guys. Thanks for watching.